Today we're tackling two chapters. We're tackling chapter 8 and chapter 9. Uh, before, but before we need do that, we need to talk about uh, your characters. This is a counseling class, and uh, we're going to be counseling online. You're going to be counseling online, and what you need is a character so that uh, your uh, cohorts, uh, your uh, classmates, can um, counsel you. Uh, and of course, that uh, that uh, character has to have a problem that you've never had or have never been have never actually experienced either uh, personally or someone close to you so we need to get those in uh, if you want an example you can go to uh, the discussion page and go all the way down to the bottom and there you will see uh, an example of um, of someone's I can't remember who did it uh, but uh, we have one uh, they did uh, more than you need to do. Uh, actually, all you need to do is fill out the history form, um, come up with a um, with a uh, fictional name, uh, so that we can get get this done. We need, uh, and we'll probably start counseling on the tenth week. Uh, right now, we're tackling eight and nine. I think there's fifteen chapters in this. There are fifteen chapters in this book. So we're going to be done in about. Uh, we're going to be done with all the lectures uh, in uh, in a couple weeks. Uh, so about two thirds of the way through the sem semester, uh, we're going to start counseling. Okay, so get them in so that we can uh, we can put them up and uh, uh, so that we can start counseling. Um, this chapter is about expressing understanding. Being empathic uh, involves connecting with clients by attuning to their thoughts and feelings. Of what is shared, one must consider the content of what they say, the feelings that they're expressing in what they say, and the possible meanings behind what they've said. Uh, an example of this, uh, this past weekend, I had a, uh, uh, I attended my 50th college uh, class reunion. Uh, before that, uh, the uh, individual that put it together uh, wanted uh, some information and uh, he wanted us to give him anecdotes about what we remembered about uh, about our college uh, experience and I sent him a, uh, a copy of what I, uh, I I typed out a, uh, a narrative of, of what I experienced when I was in college and uh, it was really kind of interesting because he <laughs> he sent it back to me and he said, uh, I can't say this. And then he sent me his edited version um, of, uh, of what happened. And, and the reality is, I mean, he did ask us for this information and then he told me that mine was wrong. Now, of course, that's completely incorrect. That's completely uh, inappropriate. Um, he, he asked us for information and I sent it to him. And he told me that uh, that I didn't know what I was what I was sending him. Really kind of strange. So obviously he didn't do these three things. Um, he misinterpreted the feelings. He uh, misinterpreted the possible meanings behind uh, by, behind what I told him. According to Norcross, the empathic uh, practitioner attends to what is said and is at the periphery of of awareness as well as what is said and is the focal uh, awareness. And so you need to focus on, on the client. And that's what this individual is doing. She's listening uh, to this individual. And she's f completely focused on, on what they're, they're talking about. Empathy is seeing the world as the person sees it, uh, not as you would see it if you were in their situation. And that's, of course, what my, what my friend did. Uh, he told me that, uh, okay, if you experience this, you misinterpreted what had happened. Of course, that was 50 years ago, and that's a lot of water under the bridge. Uh, but that was, he's a lawyer, so he, uh, he didn't want to say anything negative about the college. Feeling the way that person feels about the situation, understanding the meaning that the person is giving to events, grasping, grasping the assumption that influences their particular worldview. By being empathic, a practitioner can learn to connect with people from different backgrounds and experiences. And uh, this is really quite important because 
the probability that you're going to be dealing with individuals that are exactly like you is not very high. Uh, the reality will be, that, of course, that you have a college education and the, uh, the person that you're talking to, unless you talk to only other individuals with college educations, uh, they won't have the same education level that you have, so the probability is not very high. The essence to uh, building a client-practitioner relationship depends on whether the client feels understood. Clients will not share personal thoughts and feelings unless they feel understood. If a practitioner can establish a sense of empathic understanding with the client, they're more likely to build a therapeutic relationship. Expressing empathy means communicating and understanding of another person's experience, their behavior, their viewpoint, their meanings, and their feelings. Empathy involves restating in their own words your understanding of what the client is expressing. When a practitioner uses empathic understanding because the client feels understood, they are more likely to be open and trusting, share more of their thoughts and feelings, help clients who are having trouble expressing themselves. When a practitioner uses empathic understanding, they are validating the client's experience. It shows the client that the practitioner accepts and understands the client's experiences and concerns. This is especially important if the client has been told that their point of view is incorrect due to an abusive relationship. And a lot of times that is uh, that's one of the problems that uh, that people have. They're in, a, in, in an abusive relationship and uh, the abuser keeps telling the, uh, the individual that uh, they're not experiencing, they shouldn't be feeling the things that they're feeling because they're, they're in, inaccurate, that they're incorrect in, in interpreting uh, the abuse as abuse. Sorry, I needed a drink. Students often feel awkward or uncomfortable trying to express empathic understanding. Most societal norms don't allow people to talk about feelings. Nodding and saying, uh-huh, is less personal, of course. And this is about the saddest picture you ever saw. She wants a high five, and she didn't get it. Don't leave me hanging, I think is one of the things that people say, and she got left hanging. When reflecting content, practitioners restate their understanding of what the client has said. This reflection of the client's reality indicates to the client that the practitioner is trying to understand. Uh, are you saying, what I hear you saying is, as I understand it, it sounds like, and of course by, by using a statement similar to that, uh, you're, you're uh, expressing the fact that you are hearing what the client is actually saying. Practitioners must show that they are attuned to a client's emotional experiences, and they can do this by reflecting feelings. Besides what the client is saying, the client's feelings can be discerned from their body language, from their tone of voice, and from their facial expressions. And from this, we can see that this young lady is, is angry. Uh, her body language uh, tells us that she's angry. I'm assuming her tone of voice does. I'm guessing that she's yelling, and certainly her facial expression is an angry facial expression. Reflecting feelings may be accompanied by a softer voice or leaning uh, forward to imply deeper connection with what the client is expressing. More firmness if the client is expressing negative emotions like anger, disgust, and dismay. Now, the, the reality is that, uh, that I sent... Uh, my narrative about uh, about my experiences at my, my institution, at my college, um, three or four months ago. And uh, we had argued back and forth, and he just wanted seemed to want to argue. He didn't want to put it in the way I wrote it. And, of course, he was, uh, uh, not, he, he was not expressing the, the emotion that, that I was uh, talking about. He kept telling me that I was incorrect. And, of course... Um, uh, in order, since we had gone through this over and over and over again, uh, when I finally saw him, I yelled at him and told him that he was, he was watering down what I said. And of course, he wasn't used to being yelled at. He didn't like it. 
Uh, he's got lots of money, so you know how wealthy people are. They don't like people to to uh, to tell them that they've done something wrong. Uh, so it was it was really kind of an intense moment, but it was one that needed to happen because he uh, was doing a poor job of, of relating what I had told him. Getting the client's feelings wrong is all right. Uh, as long as you share your hunches in a tentative voice, clients will probably feel comfortable correcting you. Some feelings are not as acceptable in select cultures as in others. The client, uh, you know I haven't heard from any of them. If they are busy, they could, be at least, they could at least email me. The practitioner might say something like, it sounds like you feel sad about that. The client sounding angry and speaking with a tight jaw. I feel like we just aren't getting anywhere. And you might reflect, you might say, uh, you seem to be feeling impatient with me and, your, and, our, and our progress. Uh, the client might say, some of the uh, client on a team might say, some of the people on this team just aren't carrying their weight. And you might reply to them, I'm guessing you're feeling kind of frustrated. The client, uh, a family member looking scared, when, when they start fighting and yelling, I just run up to my room. And you might say, I wonder if you feel kind of scared. The client might say, yesterday out of the blue, I was one of the people they laid off. I'm not sure what I'm going to do, and you might say, Wow, that shock, that's what shocking news. You look like you are feeling quite worried and upset. In common conversation, many people believe that they are reflecting feelings that are actually expressing thoughts, opinions, or judgments. This is usually because the individual is saying, I feel that, instead of I feel, followed by an expression of feeling. I feel that you aren't paying attention to me. That's, that's a thought. I feel that this assignment is too hard. That's a thought. I feel that you children should clean your room. That's a directive. Reflecting feelings. I feel that you always misunderstand me. Uh, that's a thought and a judgment. Uh, I feel that this group is terrific. That's another thought and, and judgment. I feel that you have lots of strengths. Another thought and judgment. Families and groups practitioners may encourage members to reflect feelings. Especially in family situations, the practitioner can ask how they think someone else in the family feels. Often the problem in groups is that situations are engendering feelings that are not being expressed or acknowledged. It is possible to reflect both content and feelings in the same sentence. Using this skill allows a practitioner to include more information in the reflected comment. The client might say, can you believe it? She just left me a note telling me to leave. She hadn't said anything about leaving. And you might reflect back, uh, it sounds like you were shocked when your wife told you that she wanted you to leave. The client says, ever since I was laid off, I just mope around. I am just at a loss. And you might say, so in a way you were grieving about losing your job. Uh, a group at a picnic where one person didn't show up and didn't let them know. Uh, the practitioner might say something like, it seems like most of you are feeling hurt and a little angry that Marianne didn't show up at the picnic. Uh, the client might say, it is no fun to watch football games since dad left. And the practitioner might say, so before your dad left, the two of you used to watch football games together and now you feel sad and really miss him whenever the football games are on. Summarizing involves listening to considerable information provided by the client and communicating understanding of that information. Sometimes clients have so much information to share that practitioners listen for some time before making a reflecting comment.
In the dominant culture in the United States, it is considered impolite to interrupt. But after taking in masses of information from the client, it is considered appropriate for the practitioner to interrupt in order to summarize. The client, I am really trying hard in school, but I can't seem to get the grades that I want. And the practitioner might say, you sound discouraged because even though you are working hard, you are disappointed with your grades. The client says, when I am angry with my friend, I tell her how I feel, and then she does the same thing again. And the practitioner might say, maybe, there it is. Uh, oops, I'm sorry. Same thing again. And the practitioner might say, it sounds like you are unhappy because your friend has ignored what you told her about how you feel. There we go. At the beginning of a session, as I remember our last meeting, we focused on how distressed you uh, felt about your wife's roller coaster behavior toward you. When she is friendly, you feel good and get more work done. And when she is distant, you worry and have trouble sleeping and focusing on work. Is that how you remember it? Uh, and that's what you might say at the beginning of the session. And at the end, you might uh, summarize things by saying, we have discussed both sides of the issue and noted the pros and cons of each direction we could go. I appreciate how difficult this discussion has been for some of you. It appears that some members of the group seem to be troubled when people disagree with each other. At the beginning, of the summarization at the beginning of a, of a group session, everyone in the group seems relieved that we have agreed to, to keep all the information confidential. Uh, this is what might, you might say by summarizing uh, the end of a family session. Jamie and Mary, you seem to be ready to take charge of some of the family problems. It has been hard to disagree with your children on what should happen next. I can imagine that you children are upset because you think your opinions don't count. Reflecting meaning is when a practitioner expresses their understanding of the underlying meaning of what the client is discussing. Reflecting meaning is, is not as straightforward as understanding content or feeling. To understand meaning, the practitioners need to not only be good observers of the behavior, and tone that accompanies the content, but also must listen for the possible meaning of a client uh, that the client is giving to a situation, an action, a thought, or a feeling. When working with clients who come from different backgrounds than your own, it is particularly important to express your tentative understanding of their meaning. For example, a student from a Chinese or Chinese American family must always get excellent grades or be considered a disgrace to their family. Now, now we're trying to reflect feelings or meanings, I'm sorry. A client wringing her hands and looking worried. I thought we had a good marriage until my husband told me that he lost his job and had spent our family money on seeing call girls. We are very religious and want to put this marriage back together. I hear you value your marriage and at the same time are shocked and worried about your husband's behavior. Is that right? Uh, counseling group member, I, I really enjoy spending time with the man I am dating, but my job is so demanding these days that I am feeling stressed and worried about getting everything done. And the practitioner might say, it sounds like you really value time with George and also want to do a good job at work. Family member, since Bob the father lost his job, it seems like we go from one stress to the next all the time. It is like everyone is worried most of the time, not at all like it used to be. And the practitioner might say, so the stress related to Bob being unemployed is affecting everyone. Sounds like you are longing for the fun times you used to have in your family. Task group member finishing this project is taking forever. I am sick of having to do so much extra work. I wonder if it is worth it. And the practitioner might say, you sound frustrated and kind of discouraged too. 
It sounds like you wonder if the project is as important as you once thought. Is that right? And then you pause. How are, you, are the rest of your feelings? Of you, How are the rest of you feeling? Talking to everyone, of course. When developing a relationship, it is important to deal directly with diversity variables. For many clients, having a worldview similar to that of the practitioner is more important than differences in their age, differences in ethnicity, in race, in gender, in sexual orientation, in education, and physical differences. Language can prove to be a barrier even when the practitioner and the client speak the same language. One may speak in slang. One may speak using a great deal of jargon. Uh, the client may be from a region that the practitioner is not familiar with. Different generations may use the same words and phrases differently. Uh, a good example would be hook up. Um, uh, two decades ago, if you said you needed a hookup, it meant that you either needed your electricity turned on or you needed to attach your trailer to your car. And now, of course, if a teenager talks about hooking up, uh, they're not talking about electricity and they're certainly not talking about their car. They're talking about having sex with somebody. So, you know, <laughs> you got to be careful. Sometimes, sometimes words uh, have new meaning and that's what you need to understand, the new meaning. It is important to express empathy in cases where the client is from a different ethnic group, from a different age, from a different gender, uh, have a, they are a different gender, uh, a different religion, and have different physical dis uh, abilities. Conveying that you completely understand how they feel is rarely accurate and hardly useful. And you can imagine how uh, how you what you might say to an individual that had lost a leg in, uh, while they were in the military. Uh, you, you even if you've been in the military, you certainly don't probably don't understand what it feels like. And even if you uh, you have lost a limb, you still don't understand what that person feels like. Your goal is to understand how the client feels, what they experienced, and what meaning that experience had for them. Empathic understanding increases the client's sense of being understood. It takes considerable courage to openly discuss concerns with a stranger. And of course, this is something that you need. Uh, to, you need to understand that you don't understand. You need to understand that uh, that uh, the meaning that you and how you interpret things may not be the meaning that the client uh, has. And that's the end of chapter eight. Now we need to tackle chapter nine. Gaining further understanding. So this is a week of understanding. Okay. Before asking questions, it is important to express understanding by reflecting feelings, content, meaning, and summarizing. And of course, we went over that last in the last chapter. Questioning without expressing understanding may seem like grilling. Uh, Open-ended questions are questions that require more than one or two word answers. They invite clients to express opinions and feelings. Open-ended questions generally begin with who, what, when, or how. How do you feel about that? Tell me about, uh, as you can see, that would uh, force them uh, to do more than uh, uh, just give you a one or two word answer. Will you tell me about more about Will you tell me more about how you feel when? Will you explain more about? Tell me about who uh, has helped you with this problem. How have other people helped you with this problem? What led you to seek help at this time? Tell me about improvements you have noticed since our last appointment. What would your life be like if this problem wasn't going on? How have others you know uh, solved this type of problem? Who have you uh, talked to about this problem? How did it help to talk to others about the problem? These are all open-ended questions. Tell me about how about what it feels like to have this problem. 
How have you solved the other problems in your life? What do you understand about the kind of help I might offer you? Tell me about what you have done to work on this problem. Closed-ended questions are questions that can be answered with one or two words. Closed-ended questions are appropriate when the counselor is seeking specific information. How old are you? What is your address? How many other people live in your house? They give you facts and are easy to answer. Skilled practitioners choose the type of question to ask based on their goals. Beginning practitioners often re, uh, overuse closed-ended questions. Using closed-ended questions may imply a practitioner's need to be in control rather than work collaboratively with the client. Some clients treat open-ended questions as closed-ended questions by giving one-word responses, and this has been my experience. People don't, they really don't want to talk, and the reason they don't want to talk is because they're not exactly sure who you are. Uh, so the, the trick is to get them to talk to you, uh, and strangely, I have, seem to have the ability to make people talk. Uh, I probably... I talked to more people this weekend. See, people go to reunions to see specific people, uh, but I go to reunions to see everybody. And so it's easy for me to talk to anybody. Uh, I don't know if it has anything to do with my training, uh, but uh, this weekend I probably talked to more different people than anybody. It is necessary for the counselor to encourage them to speak more, tell me more about when did this problem start? What do you like about school? Recess, of course. <laughs> what do you do when your husband comes home drunk? Do you check in with each other at the beginning of their meetings? Yes or no. Do you eat dinner together? Yes or no. Asking more than one question at a time, asking more than one question at a time is confusing. In their reply, they will only answer one question, and they may potentially miss important information. It is hard for you both to work and study. How does your family feel about this? And, of course, if you do that, then what you're doing is you're, you're truncating the information that you're going to get. You're not going to get as much information as you should. Asking multiple-choice questions uh, may inhibit the client's exploration. How do you feel about that? Sad? Confused? Angry? However, with a client who has a limited vocabulary or isn't used to expressing their feelings in words, the occasional multiple choice question can help. And here we have a multiple choice question as to where you want to go. Up, down, all of the above, or none of the above. That's kind of a funny cartoon. Asking rapid fire questions, uh, while this form of questioning is common in some cultures, most people feel that this style fits more with interrogation, not with creating cooperative working relationships. Attempts at showing understanding should uh, come between questions. Questions with a suggestion embedded. Uh, sometimes questions are used to inform or persuade clients about their, your point of view. Don't you think this is important for you to go back to school and complete your GED? What do you think of trying to exercise more to decrease your depressed mood? And of course, those are questions with a that you're pointing, trying to point to a specific idea. Questions that begin with why often invite people to feel defensive. Why questions rarely invite open discussion and may be experienced as attacking. People actually often aren't aware of why they act the way that they do. Problems or challenges are important to explore. The history of the, of the challenge, the length or duration, uh, the current changes, previously employed attempts at a solution, the severity and frequency of a problem. Uh, the reality is a lot of times uh, when I'm talking to, to clients, one of the things that I'm hearing, what, one of the things that happens is they give me, they start the story in the middle. Um, it happens constantly. Uh, so you don't have the background of why this happened uh, or 
or what happened. A lot of times you just get the middle of the of the question. I, I notice that happens a lot uh, uh, on the Navajo Nation. Uh, at, at the college, a lot of times, instead of instead of getting the whole story, a lot of times what's happening is you're getting the story from a certain point of view or from a, a certain point, uh, and you don't know the background. So then you maybe you make a suggestion about something, and instead of and, and they say, "Oh, we tried that, you know, five years ago. We tried that seven years ago." And, and of course, you don't know. You didn't know that because they didn't really give you that information. Using scaling questions can be valuable. Uh, using a one to ten scale to rate an aspect of the problem. What aspects of the client's life are affected by the problem? Uh, the situation and environment are also important, and can sometimes give a more complete perspective on the problem. A nurturing and sustaining environment can support a client through many stressors. What life stressors has the client experienced? The number of children and other people in the house, job demands, deaths, illnesses, and or major health challenges. What life stressors has the client experienced? Current or past traumatic events in family or community, demands related to school, church involvement, volunteer activities. Uh, the, right now I'm reading a book called Looking for Alaska, uh, which it, Alaska is a is a young lady. That's uh, that's her name, um, and uh, she has uh, died in an automobile accident. And they're trying to figure out whether she committed suicide or whether it was an accident. And uh, part of the problem is they don't have they don't know her history. Everybody, uh, she was a very attractive young lady, and uh, everyone knew her uh, superficially. Uh, because they knew who she was right now, and they knew who she was, who she projected, but they didn't know who she had been, uh, and why she acted the way that she did, because uh, people didn't want to have more than a superficial relationship with her, because of her, uh, because she was uh, attractive, and she was, uh, uh, she had a really good personality, and because of that, people just didn't ask her any questions. Um, so then she, something happened to her and now they, they, they don't understand why. And uh, if someone, if someone had taken the time to ask that question, then potentially they would have been able to understand what was going on with her and maybe stopped her from doing what she did. But of course, I'm like uh, about 50 pages away from the last, from the end of the book. And I still don't have any answers. So, you know, as a psychologist, is driving me just a little bit crazy. If the practitioner is genuine, uh, clients feel more comfortable exploring. Uh, being stiff, distracted, or, or detached does not indicate genuineness. Genuineness is indicated by being natural, by being sin sincere, by being authentic, by being candid, by being honest, and being forthright. And that's one of the reasons why people... Uh, tend to talk to me because when I listen to them, I really listen to them. I listen to everything that they say, and I notice what's going on with them. They're, they're, uh, uh, what they're projecting, uh, how they're saying uh, things to me, uh, and it was really kind of interesting that I was able to get information from people this weekend that uh, that other people didn't have a clue about. And that is the end of chapter nine. So. Uh, one of the things I need from you is uh, I need um, <laughs> uh, I need your your uh, your character histories. Uh, so when you get those done, just email those to me so that I can put them online. Uh, it's about the only way I can do it. Um, maybe I need a Dropbox on the uh, on the website, uh, but uh, every time I make I create a Dropbox. It, it creates other problems for me. So just email them to me if you would, and uh, I'll put them online, and uh, we can get this thing started in about uh, four weeks. Yeah, in about four weeks, since this is the sixth week. So I'll see you next week, okay? Talk to you later.